put down, or else he would someday convince others to follow after him. This certainly sounds like a form of persecution to me. One recent anti-Mormon publication has argued that the traditional story of the first vision didn't even exist until it was written down in 1838 and wasn't well known among Latter-day Saints until 1840. The theory of Joseph's detractors is that the first vision story was simply invented as an afterthought in the grand scheme of the restoration scam. But on this slide, we see a great deal of evidence to the contrary. From this timeline, we learn that in February of 1830, Joseph Smith's own hometown newspaper announced that he had seen God personally. And in the following decade, Joseph Smith and the missionaries of the church taught Mormons and non-Mormons alike about the appearance of the Father and the Son in a grove of trees in the year 1820. These sources even report that the phrase made famous in the prophet's 1838 account, this is my beloved son, hear him, was generally known. Was Joseph's secret experience related to only a few individuals, as anti-Mormons claim? No. In fact, just the opposite is true. In 1831, the prophet told a crowd of nearly 250 people about this glorious manifestation, and in 1834, he related it in the midst of many large congregations. Anti-Mormons like to point to the 19th century sources that claim Joseph Smith became a Baptist exhorter around 1821, a Baptist convert around 1824, and then a member of the Methodist Church again in 1828. The argument is made that these actions show that the prophet really wasn't commanded in 1820 by the Father and the Son not to join any of the churches, and therefore he must have fabricated the whole story. Let us take a look at these allegations in their order. First, there's the assertion that Joseph Smith became a Methodist exhorter around 1821. The evidence used to justify this claim is a quotation from Orsamus Turner, which is found on the left-hand portion of this slide. I am confident that anti-Mormons have misinterpreted this source just like the Jedediah M. Grant quote that was mentioned earlier. I contend that this source is not talking about Joseph Smith acting as an exhorter in the evening meetings of the Methodist denomination, but rather the evening meetings that were the gatherings of the juvenile debate club. This conclusion is supported by a newspaper article in the Western Farmer, which announced that the Palmyra Debate Club would begin meeting in the local schoolhouse on 25th of January, 1822. We learned from first-hand witnesses that children around Palmyra were attending school during the winter months and through the end of May. Since school was in session during the same time period when the debate club was meeting, it would not be possible for them to occupy the same building at the same time. Therefore, the debate club would have to meet at the schoolhouse during evening hours. It should also be noted that no anti-Mormon has ever bothered to explain just how Joseph Smith became a Methodist exhorter without first becoming a Methodist. And remember, Pomeroy Tucker said in his book that Joseph Smith did not convert to the Methodist faith. What about Fayette Lampham's claim that the father of Smith told him around 1830 that his son had joined the Baptist Church around 1824? Mr. Lampham made this claim in 1870, which was 40 years after the statement was supposedly made. This claim cannot be taken seriously since no official record of Joseph Smith's baptism into the Baptist Church has ever been produced, and nobody else ever mentioned this alleged event except for Fayette Lampham. It should also be noted that according to Josiah Stowell Jr., Joseph Smith did not profess religion when he was 20 years old or thereabout, meaning that he did not belong to any church around the year 1826. If Joseph had become Baptist around 1824, we would expect him to declare as much to Josiah Jr. just two years later. Mr. Lampham's memory is simply not supported by documentary sources. There is no verifiable evidence that Joseph Smith ever became a Baptist. Now, what about the charge that the prophet sought membership in the Methodist Episcopal Church in June of 1828? Anti-Mormons tried to support this idea by citing a joint statement published by Joseph and Heil Lewis, who claimed nearly 51 years after the fact that the prophet sought to join the Methodist Episcopal Church in Harmony, Pennsylvania at the same time that he was translating his gold Bible. But as can be seen on this, Michael Morris, the Methodist class leader in Harmony, Pennsylvania, at the time this alleged event took place, stated unambiguously that Joseph Smith did not seek to become a full member. The prophet did indeed 
attend Methodist gatherings in harmony, but did he do so with the intent of converting? This is exceedingly unlikely. Why? Because Joseph declared to one of the residents of Harmony between December 1827 and May of 1829 that he was a prophet sent by God to convert other people. For it is recorded that during Joseph's stay in Harmony, he undertook to make a convert of Nathaniel Lewis, who was the deacon in the local Methodist church and also the father of Joseph and Hyle Lewis. Nathaniel said that he would become one of Joseph's disciples if he could test those spectacles that he was using to translate the golden plates. But Joseph declined his offer. Finally, let us not overlook the reference found in Doctrine and Covenants section 10, where in the summer of 1828, the Lord told Joseph Smith that he would establish his church in that generation if the people would not harden their hearts with this prospect looming on the horizon why in the world would Joseph Smith need to join any other church? Let us move on now to how anti-Mormons make claims connected with the angel Moroni. In this section, I would like to say a few words about the notion that Joseph Smith had a dream about the angel instead of a vision. The argument that the personage appearing to the prophet couldn't have been Moroni since he, was spoken, he spoke about Moroni. The assertion that Joseph Smith couldn't decide whether to call the angel Moroni or Nephi, and the very strange idea that the prophet learned about the golden plates from a bleeding Spanish ghost. <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> There's a group of 19th century non-Mormon documents that say Joseph Smith learned about the existence of the golden plates in a dream instead of a vision. Critics point to these documents and proclaim that the prophet didn't have a real-world experience with a heavenly being, it all just happened in his subconscious mind. But on this slide, you'll see that the dream notion was formally refuted in the church's official newspaper in July 1835. Oliver Cowdery, who spoke with Joseph Smith before committing his words to paper, referred to the experience as an open vision. He noted that Joseph Smith was definitely awake because he was praying at the time. This experience, said Oliver, was not a dream. The prophet confirmed these points just a few months later when he wrote in his diary that he was not asleep before this manifestation took place, and he classified the experience as a vision. Anti-Mormons, of course, will not be convinced by these statements. They will point out that the church's official refutation was printed six years after the first dream document appeared in print. But as can be seen by the information on this timeline, the prophet had been teaching members of his family and his close associates since 1823 that he had been visited in person by a heavenly messenger, and he classified this experience over and over again as a vision. It is also important to see that on this slide, before the first dream document showed up in 1829, Daniel Hendricks in Palmyra and Thurlow Weed in Rochester were both told by Joseph Smith himself that he had had a vision. And David Whitmer heard the experience characterized by the same word when he was speaking with the townspeople of Palmyra in early 1828. Notice also on the upper right-hand corner of this slide that in 1831, two years after the first dream document appeared, non-Mormon newspaper editor Orson S. Turner was not sure whether he should describe Joseph's experience as, quote, a dream or a vision, unquote. When the dream documents are seen in their historical context, it becomes obvious that they really aren't all that impressive. <laughs>